Lips of a bite, no reorder In the order, yeah Who is said no order? Yes, I'd come up so such as Good afternoon. It's so good to be here with you today to share these few moments together to share this message. We do this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at a story that you've probably all heard. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's very interesting that our church fathers ask us to read this. This is what we call the lectionary reading. Now lectionary, this is the order in which we read the Gospels, the order in which we read Holy Scripture in the church. Every Sunday when you come to the Divine Liturgy, there are three readings that are read to the people, one from the Old Testament, one from the Epistles, namely, most primarily from the, the, the writings of St. Paul, but also from the writings of some of the other Apostles. And then the final reading is the Gospel message. This, this is what the lectionary is all about. So when I say that we're going to be taking a scriptural passage from our lectionary, it means it is a, it is a passage for that specific Sunday. So today, our church fathers have instructed us to read the message from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 14, in which we see Jesus performing this incredible, incredible miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now, we're going to be talking about it in a little different terms because remember, we just celebrated Pentecost a few weeks ago. And in a couple weeks, we're going to be celebrating the Transfiguration. It's always important to understand these scriptural passages within the context of the entire church calendar because it prepares us, it gives us a message, but unique for that day. Now let's think about it for a moment. What was Pentecost? Empowering us, empowering the church. The Holy Spirit descended and gave power to those disciples to become apostles. See, at the Great Commission, at Ascension Day, those disciples, the students of Jesus, were now instructed to go. So they became the apostles, those who were sent. But they needed the tools, and the tool... Of course, the primary tool is given to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended on them on Pentecost, or in Armenian we call it Hoke Galust. It's the descent of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and it forms the church. And the church is empowered to do the work of Jesus Christ on earth. Namely, to go out to the sick to go out to the poor, to preach to the, to the good news, to the captives, to tell people that the acceptable day of the Lord has arrived, that the kingdom of God has been enacted. Now this is what the church is empowered to do. And so in each of these passages, if you remember last week, we looked at a passage again that came from the Gospel of St. Matthew, in which the disciples wanted a sign, and Jesus says, you've been given a sign. They're all around you. The sign of Jonah in the, in the whale. This is the sign. In other words, don't look for bigger miracles. The greatest miracle has already happened. The resurrection. And you are a testament to that. Each of us, because we are living, we are as Christians today. Some 2,000 years after the actual resurrection of Christ, the church is not only living, but it is creating itself. It is moving forward. It is driving and it is reaching out. That's a testament to resurrection. It couldn't be held at the crucifixion. It is now resurrected. And we are, we are testaments to that resurrection in each of our lives. Because each of us have had crucifixions. Collectively, as Armenians, we've had a crucifixion. Many crucifixions. War, in fact, genocide. And yet, we have resurrected and we move forward. And so, each of these messages that come to us during this period of Pentecost is a reminder that we have been empowered. If you remember the week before, it was talking about miracles and uh, talking about how th there is something greater than the temple. Well, what is greater than the temple, greater than the rules, but Jesus Christ. 
So each of these readings points to us in a unique direction. Now let's take a look at what happens in this one. It shows us that the disciples were with Jesus and they were concerned because there was a big following. People were coming and they were getting hungry. See, the disciples were thinking about that physical need of the people. And let's see what it says. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew in a boat to a lonely place. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And he went ashore. He sat. And he saw a great, great, great throng. And he had compassion on them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place. And the day is now over. Send the crowd away to go into the village and buy food for themselves. See, the disciples, they said, hey, you know, there's too many people. Too many people. Deal with it. You know, like, send them away and let them come back tomorrow. And listen to what Jesus says. He says, they, Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Now, it's interesting that Jesus turns it around and he says, you give them something. Do you see the empowerment of the church? Again, we're being uh, reminded of that. We're in this period of Pentecost. A few weeks ago, the Holy Spirit comes down. He empowers, Jesus empowers the church to have that commission to go out into the world to preach the gospel, and the empowerment comes by God. So it's always stressing that it's no longer up to him to show us more miracles. The miracles have already happened. You feed them, he says. You don't need me. You've already been given the greatest of all miracles. You've seen the resurrection as a church. Today you are the body. Take care of the people. You can do it. That empowerment is so important. It's important for us to understand that as Christians, we are called to the family of Christ. We are called to the family of God. And you look for miracles. Sometimes we look for thunderbolts and lightnings. They're all around us. The miracles are at the beach when you see those waves crashing and the small little life living there. You say, wow. Who can create this but a divine creator? That is a miracle. You look into your child's eye. You look into your neighbor's heart and you see the presence of God there. That is a miracle. That as human beings, we are able to see the presence of God all around us. Jesus is constantly reminding us, don't look for the supernatural. The supernatural is when you take on that nature. When you become natural yourself, you understand that God has given you all the tools that you need. The Holy Spirit works within us. And he says, you go and take care of the people. Again, another reminder. Just like the past two weeks, I invite you to go back and look at the lectionary readings of the past two weeks. Again, from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is again emphasizing that he has empowered us. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to us to take charge to take charge as the Christian body, as that body that has to do Christ's work here in this world. Now, I want to I want to uh, point you to an, another thing that's very unique about this story. It says, Then he ordered the crowds to go sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up at heaven, blessed it, broke it, and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate with satisfaction. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. So from that five loaves and two fishes, not only did all those people eat, but they took up, they, they took up leftovers. What does that tell us? That there was actually, well, quote unquote, what we want to call the miracle. There was there was a multiplication of the food. In other words, what they started off was less than what they collected at the end. So obviously, something happened there, right? Now, listen to this. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So the women and children, let's say 10,000 people were, were fed. And then he says, after this, he dismissed the crowd. Listen to this. This is what I want to center on. After this, he dismissed the crowds, 
he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. This story is a beautiful story, and you've probably seen movies made about this, Jesus multiplying the, 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 the bread and the fish. But I'm telling you, the greater miracle is in that following sentence. Because you see, everything is going right for Jesus. He's got crowds. He's got crowds following him. In other words, he's popular, right? In fact, to the point where he tries to dismiss them and he tries to go off in, in, into a lonely place and the crowds follow him. What does that tell you? Well, this is the, the, in his time, he was the most popular of people. People wanted to come. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to touch him. They were putting him up on a pedestal. And he was healing the people. He was speaking to the people. And now he does the greatest of all miracles. He actually multiplies, physically multiplying the food. Now, what does he do? Did you catch that? What I read at the very end? It says, he withdrew and he prayed. That, to us, should be the real miracle. You see, we usually pray, you and I, we pray when we are in our hour of need. When things aren't going well, when we are lonely, when the people aren't following us, when somehow not only we're not doing miracles, we're not even doing our lives, and we say, oh God, help us, help us, help us. Jesus gives us the example. When things are going right, he prays. This is why it's so important that we understand that a prayerful life means to find that seclusion, to really focus, realign ourselves with what is important. When I invite you to come to our churches, when I invite you to come to the Divine Liturgy, a lot of times people come up to me and say, well, we went to the Divine Liturgy, and you know, it's, it's celebrated in classical Armenian. I didn't understand it. It's not about you understanding it with your head but try to understand with your heart. In other words, God is giving you 168 hours every week to enjoy, to really, to, to share in His blessings, to create, to go all around. Now that one hour that you go to the Divine Liturgy, it's the time to look within, to quiet down, to find that place that Jesus found, to find that place away from all the hustle and bustle, from all the actions, from all the multitudes, and really focus in on what is important. You see, we don't give ourselves enough time really to, to, to center in on all of the wonders that we have available to us. We look for miracles and the miracles are already around us. But we fail to see them because we're so scattered. We think that they're going to come by thunderbolts and lightning and loud noises when all of a sudden we realize that the most precious of miracles are right next to us. Famous writer during the 1970s, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was actually a Soviet dissident, and he wrote this beautiful, beautiful piece. I'll never forget it. It is a short essay about a small little duckling. And he describes the feather of that duckling. And he says that with all the scientists in the world, you can't even put, get that feather in a test tube. And he is a testament to the real miracle of life. Think about it, the structure of that small little feather and how detailed it is. Think about your life. Think about our life collectively as a people. Look how complicated it is and yet we as people are invited to participate in this complex thing we call life. How beautiful it is. That is the miracle. Take some time, as Jesus did, in all of your blessings, and even when you have some difficulties, to not whine about it, but to stop and really focus in. What is important? What is necessary to my life? Have you ever thought that the biggest miracle is you? As I said a few minutes ago, if you're, if you're here, if you're watching this, if you're alive, that is the miracle. Do you realize that just 95 years ago, the Turkish government said straight out that there will be one Armenian left in the entire world, and that Armenian will be in a museum. And the idea that we are not only here, but we are creating, we are living. We are a living testament to resurrection, to miracles. And so again, 
with all of the passages that we've been reading during this season of Pentecost, they all point to the big miracles that are all around us. Jesus says, do not look for those signs. The sign has already been given to you. There is resurrection. Jesus says over here, you're looking to feed the people. They've already been fed. You feed them. You've been given this beautiful thing called life. Take advantage of it. Go out there, talk to people, tell people how beautiful God's blessings are in your life. And you become now the disciple turned apostle, taking that message in this period of Pentecost, finding the strength with the Holy Spirit on your side to be able to conquer all that is in front of you. You see, we are the apostolic church. We are called to this apostolic mission and we have it within us to be able to do it. Not because of who we are, but because God has ordained us. God has given us that power of the Holy Spirit. Take advantage. Take some time this week to follow the example of our Lord. Find some small space. Find an, uh, an area where you can really focus in on what's important. I invite you to find that space within our churches. It, there are beautiful opportunities to go into church and not say, what am I going to get out of this? But say, let me close my eyes and see what I can give back to life. And God will talk to you. God will talk to your heart. God will give you those answers. You'll see. It's a, it's a beautiful miracle that takes place. We are transposed when we go to those churches. Now in a few, a few weeks we're going to be celebrating the transfiguration. We'll be talking more about it in the coming weeks, but for right now I invite you to get involved. Get involved in your church in a very small way, in a very big way. Go to our diocesan website and pull down the parishes tab and you'll find a church that's close to you if you don't have a church already. If you do, get involved by talking to your priest, by talking to people in, inside the church and saying that we are the Church of Jesus Christ, the Apostolic Church. How can I bring my participation to this grand uh, mission of the Church? Hey, if you want to get involved with me, you'll find me at epostle.net. That's Apostolic Evangelism for an Electronic and Expanding Universe. Until next week, let's remember that we do all of this and we always give praise and glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.